Hello everyone, my name is Pixelrips and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today we're going to revisit bamboo because this farm has not been cutting it. Well, it has been cutting it, but not quite in the way that we want it to. It's got a decent output, but of course, this style of farm is just going to be producing individual pieces of bamboo over and over again. It works fine for something like sugarcane, where you need a few sugarcane to make into paper, you occasionally need it for sugar, but the majority of the time you can let sugarcane be for a little while, whereas bamboo is a building material. It has a lot of versatile uses and we really want to acquire more of it. So just getting it in ones and twos from this farm is not really as satisfying as it could be. The farm absolutely eats bone meal if we put it on automatic mode, so you can get a few extra that way, but even that doesn't quite feel like enough. So we're going to take a bunch of the bamboo that the farm has already generated and later in the video we're going to make a large scale automatic farm using some slime block harvesting and even bring in some allays to help us gather all the bamboo so that none of it ends up doing what the bamboo is doing on top of the stalks here and just coming to rest on something else that has a hitbox and not going into the hoppers below the mud here. We're going to try our best to harvest every piece of bamboo that that farm produces and make sure that none is left behind. But before that, we need to look at the other uses of bamboo because there are a couple of subjects that I've glossed over previously in this series that I would like to cover, namely pandas, who are obviously very associated with bamboo, and scaffolding, something that I've been using throughout the time building in this world already, but I really don't feel like I've explained well enough for people who might be interested in it. Before that though, I need to visit my farmer villagers and I need to buy a cake. The player can of course craft cake themselves using an egg, two sugar, three wheat and three milk, but honestly, I prefer to buy cake from farmers where I have the opportunity to do so because it's just easier. One cake for one emerald is a pretty solid deal and cake on Java edition does not stack together. I believe it does on bedroom Bedrock edition. So Bedrock folks enjoy carrying that amount of cake around. Java players have to stuff it all in a shelter box. So our first port of call is going to be out here to the southwest, where in the distance you should start to see the bamboo canes of a bamboo jungle coming into view. You will find occasional bits of bamboo in regular jungles, but of course the environment we want is this area right here, where it is growing up in large quantities. And these biomes can be kind of difficult to navigate on foot without cutting down some of the bamboo, which is most effectively done using a sword. However, the thing to note there is that that's a sword breaking a block, which swords are not typically designed to do, so it's actually going to take two durability from your sword every time you cut a stalk of bamboo, instead of the typical one-to-one -one block to durability ratio that you get from a shovel breaking dirt or an axe chopping trees. So when it comes to large scale bamboo farming, you can just sweep through this entire area with a sword, but I will say watch the durability on that sword because <laughs> you don't want your netherite sword to break cutting down a piece of bamboo. But there is another reason to clear cut an area like this beyond just getting the bamboo for your own uses. And that is that pandas need some space to spawn. And right now the bamboo forest is so dense that pandas aren't really going to show up here in great numbers. You might occasionally find one or two of them strolling around inside the bamboo forest and they'll typically get stuck because the bamboo canes will grow very close together and you won't find a great deal of room for movement for such a large creature. But passive mob spawning for mobs like pandas will happen a lot more slowly than hostile mob spawning, so chances are this clearing won't generate pandas right away, even if we just fly away and come back. Instead, I'm going to search for pandas around the fringes of this jungle, and it looks like we actually have a couple making their way out onto the sparse jungle environment over here. And you'll already see that pandas have a variety of behaviors. This one over here seems fairly neutral. This one's just kind of chilling, biding its time, walking around in the usual way. But this one has a slightly more novel way of getting around, and that is rolling. You'll notice that it has the tongue sticking out there, kind of implying that this panda is a little bit more goofy. And naturally, you will find that pandas are attracted towards you if you are holding bamboo. And bamboo is the item that they're going to use to breed. Although, there is a chance that pandas will not choose to breed, or they will not produce offspring if you give them some bamboo to eat. So we're lucky in having a baby panda that has emerged from the union of this little couple. In fact, there is a little bit more information about panda breeding on the Minecraft wiki, so I can clarify that last bit for you. Pandas will only choose to breed if there is bamboo growing, and not just a bamboo shoot, but a fully grown bamboo plant within about a seven block 
cube around them. So in the 7x7 area around these pandas, if they don't detect any grown bamboo, they will shake their heads and choose not to breed. So if you're setting up a breeding environment for them elsewhere, make sure you plant bamboo around them with at least seven blocks radius. And that's what's going to allow the pandas to breed. And I believe that's the case on both Bedrock and Java Edition. Now, one of the coolest things about pandas is that you can hand them some bamboo. And if they don't end up breeding with another panda, they will simply sit there and munch on the bamboo shoots. This isn't true of baby pandas since they're still growing. So the bamboo that you give them will simply accelerate the process of them growing into a full size panda. But the funniest thing is they will also do the same thing with cake items if you drop them on the ground. And it depends whether or not the panda is hungry at the time, but this panda is just going to munch down that cake. And I don't believe the cake has any adverse effects on the pandas, but it is really adorable watching them eat it. Now, we can already see two of the different varieties of pandas here. We've obviously got the uh, one with the tongue sticking out that was rolling around, and we've got a relatively normal panda here. There are five other types of pandas that you can find. If you happen to find a panda that looks a little bit more happy than this one, this one's kind of frowny, indicating that it's a normal panda. But if you find one that looks a little bit more smiley and has a tendency to lie on its back, that makes it a lazy panda. These pandas are slower than the normal ones and typically won't follow the player when you're holding bamboo if they are lying on their backs already. So you have to wait for them to get up in order to have them follow you. The pandas with the tongue sticking out and rolling around are playful pandas, but you'll also find there are worried pandas out there that prefer to avoid the player and other mobs, and they'll also hide their faces during a thunderstorm, which is not something you get to see very often, especially since most of the time I sleep through thunderstorms, but it's kind of nice to see a little bit of interesting animation being added to mobs like this. If you find a panda that is even more frowny and gets aggressive, if you accidentally hit a neighboring panda, then that is an aggressive panda and they will attack the player and even other mobs. So if a skeleton shoots that panda, for example, it will go after the skeleton and attack it in much the same way that polar bears do if there's a cub around. You'll sometimes find weak pandas that are kind of snotty, and when they're baby pandas, they sneeze out slime balls, which is one of the only ways that you can acquire slime if you're playing on peaceful mode, where slimes won't spawn because they're hostile mobs. Last but not least, there is an incredibly rare variant of the regular panda, which will be a brown panda. So the black stripes in the panda texture will be replaced with a dark brown brown color. Now, when it comes to breeding pandas, there we go, we got another one there, and that one has the tongue sticking out. So you'll see that some of the parents' traits are often passed on to the children, although there is a small chance that the children can be born with a completely different genetic trait. Oh, and as you just saw, very, very briefly there, the baby panda ended up sneezing. But there's no slime balls around here, so you need to look for the snotty babies in order to get hold of some slime balls. And you'll probably need to start with a snotty parent panda to have a chance of those appearing. So in theory, we could see a bunch of different pandas spawned from just this one couple, but that would take a long time. And honestly, there aren't too many benefits to having the broad variety of pandas out there. So we might stop by the jungle occasionally and see if we can find any more of them in future. Oh, here we go. I think I have found one more panda before we get going here. This looks like an aggressive panda to me. The eyebrows are really strong. I just wanted to show you the difference in the panda texture because those characteristics are really identifiable by what's going on with their face. And this one does seem a little bit grumpy. It's huffing instead of making those little squeaking noises. He is interested in having some bamboo though. And it does seem like there's a couple more pandas over here. Oh, we got another aggressive aggressive one there. Oh, there's a couple more here as well. And this is one of the ones I'm talking about. This is one of the sneezing pandas. And it looks like, yeah, those two didn't want to breed because there wasn't enough bamboo around. But all I need to do is place a couple of bamboo shoots there. And there we go. We got a snotty panda. So let's hang around this one for a second or two and we might see those slime balls pop out. We probably shouldn't count on it though, because according to the Minecraft wiki, there is a 1 in 700 chance of a sneezing baby panda dropping a slime ball when it sneezes. So it would have to sneeze theoretically 700 times before we got a single slime ball. And once it grows up, that chance vanishes. Which is why it's not really a viable way to build a slime farm, even in peaceful mode. You're probably better off waiting for the wandering trader if you play on peaceful. Let me know in the comments of this video if you've ever seen a brown panda, either naturally spawned or one that you've obtained through breeding. Because I've only ever seen them once or twice, and they are the rarest type of panda to find or breed. So it's kind of an event every time one of them shows up. Well, we might be able to get one in the future of this series if we persevere and breed a lot of pandas or clear out the rest of this bamboo jungle. I think we're going to save that for another time. 
Back here at the base, we're going to convert a lot of the bamboo that we have just received into scaffolding, because all we need for that is six bamboo and one string. You end up with six blocks of scaffolding for all of the ingredients that you put into the recipe, so you end up with six stacks if you put a stack of each ingredient in, and that is plenty to get you started with scaffolding. Because the maximum height of the world is Y320, and the lowest point in the world, technically speaking, is Y-64, although that's a full layer of bedrock, six stacks of scaffolding will get you from bedrock to build height if you ever need to pillar up that high. Now before we go into scaffolding, I will point out that these control slightly differently on bedrock edition and Java edition. So the only tutorial I'll really be able to give here is one for Java edition because that's what I know best. Unfortunately, bedrock edition players will have to manipulate scaffolding slightly differently. Although it used to not break instantly and it does now, which is really great for bedrock players. So first of all, scaffolding needs to be placed on a solid block. It needs a solid foundation in order to get going. So right here we're just going to be placing it on a grass block, it can be placed on dirt and whatnot, but you won't be able to place it on top of a non-solid block like this ender chest here. Right clicking and that's doing nothing right now. Obviously the block itself doesn't have to be solid, it can just be the solid face of another block like this trap door, but then if I flip the trap door down the scaffolding is going to break. A pillar of scaffolding can be created in a couple of different ways. If you just look at the side face of a scaffolding block and right click on it, that will build up a tower of scaffolding for as long as you hold down the right click and still have scaffolding blocks available. So typically if you're just setting up scaffolding from ground level, you just want to right click and hold that down on the side of the scaffolding and if you end up going too high, you can always break the scaffolding from any point in the chain and it will drop all of the blocks from above. That's if you look at the side faces of the scaffolding. If you look at the top face of a scaffolding, it will place another scaffolding block in a horizontal direction depending on which way the player is facing. So whichever direction you are looking, that's the direction the game will place the next piece of scaffolding. If you create a pillar of scaffolding like this, you can stand in the scaffolding, hold jump to climb up it, and then look in any direction whilst looking down at the top face of the topmost scaffolding block to place a bridge out in any direction. And that bridge can go up to six blocks before the scaffolding can no longer support it, and that next block you place will fall and start to produce another pillar as long as it can land on a solid block. From there, of course, the bridge can extend even further, so you can effectively make a long bridge of scaffolding just from standing on this topmost platform. Breaking any of the supporting pillars of scaffolding will also break any blocks that depend on them for support, so any of the blocks of that continuous bridge are going to disappear if we break out the supports from below them. However, it's worth noting that the behavior of scaffolding changes if you are sneaking while placing it. So if we place a single piece of scaffolding there as our base block, if I hold the shift button to crouch and then I place a block on top of it, that's going to add it to the top surface of the scaffolding. But then if I crouch and look at the side face of the scaffolding and place a scaffolding block there, that's going to start the next set of bridge blocks. And so that is an inverse of the behavior that you get normally. Normally if I look at the side face of this, it starts a pillar and I have to look at the top face of the block in order to start the bridge. But of course, that works differently if I'm crouching. And there are actually a couple of ways in which you can place scaffolding in a vertical tower as you climb, basically making it a ladder that builds itself as you go. One way of doing that is to start the scaffolding at ground level, then look up and simply place the scaffolding as you hold the jump button in order to climb. But considering that you can also build whilst looking down at the top face of the scaffolding and crouching, we can hold down the crouch and jump buttons at the same time, and that will allow you to build upwards slowly, and before long you'll be standing on top of a tower that you have just easily created. Now if we want to get down from the scaffolding, we can of course crouch through it, but it takes a little while to get down this way, so a lot of the time people will simply jump off with their elytra activated, glide down to the ground, or even place a bucket of water on the ground so that they can land in it. Then punching out the bottom block of scaffolding will break all of the scaffolding above and you'll be able to collect it all as it falls. But another way of getting rid of the scaffolding and allowing yourself to fall down more safely is to hold down the shift button and tap left click so you break three or four blocks of scaffolding at a time. This allows the player to fall, but holding down the shift button will mean that you smoothly glide down through the next piece of scaffolding and the scaffolding actually breaks your fall as you go. This works very differently to pillaring with dirt blocks where you can only really break one or two of them at a time underneath you. You can break scaffolding instantly, which makes it absurdly fast to get down from higher places. But it's worth noting that that makes it potentially dangerous because you can break blocks faster than you can 
broken fall, so make sure you are holding down the shift button and leave at least one block of scaffolding for you to crouch your way through, otherwise you will take some fall damage at the end of it. Now one of the most common complaints I hear about scaffolding, especially when you're working on a tall build like this, is that you can't crouch at the top, meaning it's difficult to place certain blocks that require you to hold crouch. Like if I wanted to place these trap doors against each other for example, crouching would have me falling back down through the scaffolding, and crouching is also sometimes necessary to make sure you don't fall off the edge of scaffolding. Well here's something that you might not have considered, but it's a really useful technique for using scaffolding. All you need to do is bridge out to either side, in any direction you want to really, with another block that's going to form a bridge section of scaffolding and not a support pillar. Then if you crouch on that, you will fall through the block, but only as far as the bottom face of the scaffolding. You'll be standing inside the block, but you'll still be able to interact with the environment around you while crouching. And that's a really important technique to know, because you can actually bridge out to a distance of six blocks and still be able to crouch in this entire area, making it much easier to work on roof designs like this one. And you know what, this is actually going to be a time that I can use scaffolding, because I just realized, looking at this house, and I don't know how long it's been like this, that this double slab here is not symmetrical with this double slab over here. So I'm actually going to move this one, make sure that the double slab is there, and fix the roof of my blacksmith, which has probably been like that for about 50 plus episodes at this point. I think a while ago somebody pointed out some differences in this roof design as well, so maybe I'll be able to correct those later. But scaffolding is a really neat way of doing that quickly and leaving no mess behind. No dirt pillars you have to remove, no durability lost on your tools. A single punch can take out as much scaffolding as you can attach to a single pillar. Of course the other complaint people have about scaffolding, which is I think a fairly legitimate one, is the bridging distance thing. It is kind of annoying to only be able to bridge out six blocks before the block falls and you have to make another one, but that can be resolved by adding in a solid block anywhere on the scaffolding. We can put it here and start another section of scaffolding there and bridge out from that. We can even put it adjacent to the scaffolding right here, although that's going to take a little bit of finesse to make sure that you can place it on the edge there. Just having scooched our scaffolding up one block, or we could even pillar up from the ground place a dirt block there, and once again, as long as it has a solid block supporting it underneath, we can scaffold along for another six blocks before we have to build another support pillar. Hopefully that has clarified a few things about scaffolding for you folks, because I find this a really valuable block to use. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you're familiar with it, it becomes an invaluable tool for building. In most cases, except for the aesthetic cases, it can take the place of ladders, and it's actually harder to fall down through this than it is to fall off a ladder, so I think that honestly is a point in the scaffolding's column. The main thing I think people will find annoying about scaffolding once you're familiar with it is the fact that you will typically end up losing blocks of it here and there as you build something and a lot of the times if I'm pillaring back down from a roof and I end up breaking the scaffolding at the bottom, one or two of the scaffolding blocks will find themselves just trapped against the roof line here. In fact, I think I've just spotted the slab that somebody was pointing out. I think it's this one right here on the edge of the roof line. So let me break that. We'll replace that with a slab because it turns out that was actually a full block, but then we'll pillar up a bit more with the scaffolding and I'll show you what happens when you break it next to a structure like this. If I tap this bottom block of scaffolding, a bunch of the scaffolding is going to fall and it'll fall in a random direction, which means that we've probably lost some blocks up there on the edge of the roof. Yeah, there are three blocks up there that I can't see from down here. And if I scaffold back up to look at those, yep, it looks like they've just landed on this block on the edge of the roof. So a lot of the time you'll find yourself with less scaffolding than you started with, and it's worth treating scaffolding as a disposable resource. Otherwise you'll drive yourself mad just trying to find all of the pieces of scaffolding that have fallen onto some of the upper parts of your build, when you've broken the scaffolding to get back down. But I still find scaffolding super useful and it's worth having a large amount of it around. In fact, one of the additions I made to my utility box right after we did the ender chest organization video is a bunch of scaffolding, along with moving all of this other stuff inside of here so that we have access to a few vital resources and useful tools like name tags and leads that don't always cross your mind. Scaffolding could also be really useful as a measuring tool. Let's say you want a building to be 15 blocks long, but you don't really feel like counting things out one, two, three, four, looking at the dirt blocks. Well, in that case, you can just put 15 blocks of scaffolding in your hotbar, place one, look at the top face, and then you can place the rest of them. And just like that, you've been able to measure out 15 blocks and you can decide whether that's too big or too small or just right for your build. In future, I think I'm going to start using scaffolding blocks to mark out foundations like that, because I think that can be a really useful tool for measuring and getting the proportions of something right before you even start. 
But now we return to the prospect of a bamboo farm. And we're actually going to start a bamboo farm over here by our tree growing area. I might start it over here on the opposite side of the valley because we will need a little bit of space for it. And it's going to be a very different style of tree farm to the ones we have already set up over here. Because thanks to the slime farm that we made recently, we actually have a ton of slime blocks available so that we can implement our first slime block flying machine to be used in a collection mechanism. And that's going to operate on a timer that will harvest an entire field of bamboo and allow that to be collected by a laze. First of all, though, for style points, I'm going to grab a bunch of the blocks of bamboo that we've already made using bamboo I've collected earlier in the series. And we're going to use those to border our bamboo growing area. We're going to make this area 15 blocks wide and 30 blocks long. So I'm going to measure out that 30 blocks using scaffolding. Brings it out to about here. Yeah, that looks like a decent size. We'll pop a couple of torches down here for lighting because we're going to fill in the top layer only with grass or dirt. And we're going to leave a three by three area in the center here open because that's where the allay is going to be dropping off all of the bamboo. Then for now, we may as well start filling this growing area with bamboo shoots. And bamboo grows really fast, so some of these will start to grow almost as soon as you've planted them. With the field planted, our next step is going to be to build a redstone flying machine. We're going to grab two observers, two sticky pistons, and a bunch of slime blocks. You could also use honey blocks for this. But with honey blocks, you can only have the observers facing outwards, whereas with slime blocks, you can have the observers facing either outwards or downwards into the slime blocks themselves. In this case, it's not going to matter too much either way which one we do, but I like having mechanisms above the observers in instead of to the side of the observers to start and stop the flying machine. So in this case, we're going to set it up so that the observers are facing downwards into the slime blocks. Then we're going to add an arm of slime blocks extending out to the edge of the growing area on one side, and we should be able to add an arm of the same length on the other side. And this is what's going to break the bamboo as it travels across this growing field, which you can already see is starting to build up. Naturally, we need to dip back into the ender chest for a couple of blocks that are going to stop the flying machine in its tracks because it will need a non-pushable block at the end of the line. I'm going to use obsidian for this, but if obsidian is a bit of a pain, you can always use furnaces. On the opposite end of the platform, I'm going to give one block of room between the farm and the obsidian so that the entire flying machine can leave the farm and this bamboo can continue to grow. But now, whenever this observer detects a change in the block above it, the flying machine will take off and all of the bamboo will be cut as it travels off down the farm, eventually coming to rest over here and <laughs> having absolutely flung some of the bamboo outside of the farm. So what we're going to do is set up a barrier which is going to prevent that from happening and any items should just come to rest at the end of the farm here. We're also going to put a barrier up here around the sides, but since the flying machine uses slime blocks, we want to make sure we do that with a block that the slime blocks are not going to be pushing or pulling. So we're going to make this probably out of leaves. I think leaves are going to be the most straightforward block to use here. So we're going to build a two block high hedge of azalea leaves around the outside. I think the green will match the green of the bamboo quite nicely. And once it reaches this point, the flying machine is going to be stopped by the obsidian anyway, so these leaves aren't going to be broken. If any of the bamboo, when it gets cut, falls on top of these hedges, that's not really a concern because the LA is going to fly around and pick it up anyway. And we'll make sure that we put in a row of solid blocks on this side so that any bamboo that gets flung out is going to be caught by these blocks instead of leaving the farm entirely. Let's send the flying machine back down and check that it works going the opposite direction as well. There we go, a lot less bamboo getting bounced out of the end zone this time, so it all ends up on these blocks here, and we could set up a water stream that carries it down into some hoppers, but I think in time the LA's will be able to duck under here and grab that as well. Speaking of the LA's, we need some place for them to deposit all of the bamboo they're going to collect, and so we're going to return to this 3x3 in the center here. We can pop as much storage as we want down here, and we're going to have a series of hoppers kind of zigzagging through the center here, all leading in towards that storage chest. We're going to fill in the blocks on the corners, and we're going to have water streams pushing from this side and this side, so that all of the bamboo that gets dropped in here is going to end up in the hoppers. Let's just check for a second that that works correctly. Yep, looks like it's all going in there. And yep, everything ends up in there as well. Perfect. So by knocking a hole in the side wall here, we can collect the bamboo from underneath, or we can create another hopper chain that leads to the outside of the farm and collect stuff from there. But my hope is that when Minecraft 1.21 arrives, we should just be able to have the bamboo automatically crafted into blocks, which will save us on a lot of storage space. Now, of course, the LA's will need some sort of signal to drop the bamboo in the center here. So that's why we're going to set up a note block above the center of this farm, making sure that the components here are high up enough that they are neither going to be pushed around by the flying machine or interfere with the observers as they travel underneath. But this is going to be an observer clock facing downwards into a solid block next to the note block so that the note block isn't covered on its top surface, meaning that the note will still sound. And I'm going to turn my note block sounds down because otherwise this is going to be incredibly annoying because it will simply sound as frequently as the observers can fire. But that ringing constantly will make sure that the allays come by and drop their stuff off around this note block. They may throw stuff onto the note block or they might try to, but we're going to surround it with trapdoors above that to make sure they 
they don't. So a couple of trapdoors up each side should prevent the allays from throwing stuff directly on top of the note block, and that will mean that all of the drops end up going in this little water stream here. All that remains is to bring a couple of allays over here and then figure out how we're going to trigger the flying machine. So back in our little alcove here for the Alazi River, we of course have a bunch of allays stacked up in here waiting to be given a task, and in this case, we're going to bring these two with us. We'll need a couple of leads to get them out here in the first place. They're kind of stuck underneath the boats right now. There we go. We're going to take those cherry planks from them and swap those for a bamboo. Once the LAs get within range of the note block here, it's going to start broadcasting out to them that that's where they should be dropping their items. So let's throw a little bit of bamboo on the ground in here and see how they get on. Yep, looks like they're throwing it towards the note block. All of the drops are ending up in the water, and they can't even collect them fast enough once they're in the water because the hoppers collect them nice and easily. Now let's fire off the farm and see how the LAs handle collecting all of the bamboo that this thing is going to drop. It's going to take them a while, but they are really quite swift at this task. And there we go. They're throwing a whole bunch of it. Okay, yep, it looks like one of the LAs has actually got trapped in there with the trapdoor. So maybe we should just put a trapdoor over the top of the whole thing. <laughs> or maybe if we make this little tower of trapdoors a little bit higher. Yeah, there we go. If it's three blocks high, it looks like the LA doesn't really want to go too much higher than that. So hopefully they should throw everything at the note block before they get to high up. And the LAs will definitely dodge the flying machine as it goes by, so they're in no danger of getting pushed around by it. Let's see how they return stuff to the note block now. Yep, that's looking good to me. A three block high section of trapdoors seems to be the sweet spot for this one. And this collection method is relatively new to me. Obviously, I've been using LAs for a while, but DocM77 was the first place where I saw this type of LA drop-off point in action, and I really like it. I think it's actually kind of better than sticking a hopper minecart in a note block and using that. And the constant note block noise is only a minor inconvenience when the LAs are depositing stacks upon stacks of harvested bamboo already. Well, the only thing that's left now is to figure out how we're going to trigger the farm to activate and send that flying machine on its way. And I think we might try using daylight detectors first, because it doesn't really matter how tall the bamboo grows before it is harvested, it's always just going to start growing again pretty quickly afterwards, and daylight detectors actually change in their power level throughout the day, depending on how high the sun is. So I think just putting a daylight detector above the observer, first of all, is going to send this flying machine off down the farm. And we can place another daylight detector over the top of this observer to make sure that it returns down the farm. But then these daylight detectors are only going to send the flying machine back off again when the daylight level changes throughout the day. So this farm is going to receive several harvests per day, at different intervals. During the peak of the day, it's going to have a little bit longer to grow, but the farm will be sent off every so often, and it's just going to harvest whatever bamboo has grown, and I think that's perfect for our needs. If we wanted something a little bit more optimal, where we made sure that all of the bamboo has had a chance to grow, we could always wire this up to an etho hopper clock, and just have something simple like a trapdoor or a fence gate opening over the top of this observer. But for the time being, the daylight detector is a compact and regular way of setting off this flying machine at frequent intervals, and that's going to harvest a ton of bamboo for us when the allays will be constantly working. Although maybe we need one more set of trapdoors up there to prevent stuff like this from happening. But remember, if the allays see those loose items lying around, they are going to go and pick them up. So eventually those will get deposited correctly anyway, as long as they don't get trapped anywhere like they did before. But all in all, I think this bamboo farm is going to be much better for our needs than the previous one we had. It's definitely producing a lot more bamboo very quickly, just by virtue of growing a lot more bamboo. Look at that, we've already got enough bamboo in here that we can almost make three full stacks of bamboo blocks. And that's just from setting up the farm. Once we've let this thing run for a while, it's going to be pretty great. I'm so happy that we can finally add bamboo to our wood types that we've been farming over here. That means we really have the full set of wood types taken care of in our wood farming area. And I think I want to do a little bit more decoration around here and make this place feel a bit more industrial and alive and like there's a bit more going on than just a set of miscellaneous disconnected farms. So maybe we'll work on that in future. For now though, folks, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.